Mm, I guess we can start. So, uh, hello and welcome everyone to the next uh, next episode of Extremal and Webinar. Extremal and Combinatory. Extreme and I cannot even say the name. Extreme and Probabilistic Webinar. Uh, and we are very excited to have here today Abhishek Metuku, who is currently in University of Birmingham. And he's going to talk about proof of the Erdrash file. Faber Lovas conjecture. And before I pass the virtual speaking token, the virtual microphone to, to Abhishek, just a few questions in case you are here for the for, for the first time. So uh, in case you would have you are going to have a question during the talk to Abhishek, feel free to either uh, just uh, interrupt Abhishek and ask the question using your microphone or type it into the chat if you don't want to use your microphone during that. When the talk will be over, we will have a more formal session with the questions that is going to be recorded, like the whole, like the whole talk itself. And after that part is over, we will switch off the recording and keep the room available for maybe additional informal chat. That, so in case you want to ask some question you don't want to be on you don't want it to be on the record maybe wait for that so i guess that's all for the beginning and now let me ask abhishek uh, to, to come to the to come to the stage and yeah okay thanks john for the introduction um i'm very happy to be here um uh, okay so I will talk about uh, Erdos Faber Lovas conjecture. So this is joint work with Don Gip, Tom, Daniel, and Derek, all of us, all of whom from Birmingham. So let me just start with some very basic definitions. Um, so everyone knows what a graph and a hypergraph is. Um, so a matching is just a set of um, disjoint edges. So edges that are so edges that are all disjoint from each other, something like, so maybe this is one edge, another edge, another edge. So set of pairwise vertex disjoint edges. And um, an edge coloring is uh, a proper edge coloring is a coloring of the edges in a way that uh, two edges of the same color do not meet, do not share a vertex. And chromatic index is the minimum number of colors we need to color a graph or a hypergraph actually, so that uh, the edges are colored properly. So for example, here is a proper edge coloring of Peterson graph. And you can see that the edges are the same color like this orange and another orange and green. So they are disjoint. And here are the green edges disjoint and blue edges disjoint. So that's a proper coloring. And it, and it needs four colors as you can see. So the chromatic index of this graph is four because in well, one can show there's four colors uh, are enough. Okay, and there are many classical results, graph theory results um, for um, finding matchings. So finding large matchings like Hall's theorem, Tooth's theorem. And there are also results on edge colorings like Wiesing's theorem, which says that if your graph has maximum degree delta, then um, you can color its edges with delta or delta plus one colors. So I will use um, this notation to denote the chromatic index. So chi prime. So just to repeat, that's the minimum number of colors in a proper edge coloring of a graph. Um, so for hypergraphs, the situation is more complicated. So the definitions are the same, as I said before. Um, again, we want to color the edge. Uh, so chromatic index of a hypergraph is the minimum number of colors we need to color the edges of the hypergraph in a way that uh, edges of the same color, they don't meet. So here is a, a proper coloring, uh, just to show how complicated it is. This picture shows why it's, it's a difficult problem for hypergraphs. Um, so, so I've uh, redrawn the color classes separately. So these are the green edges, as you can see, they are disjoint pink edges and blue edges, they're all these two and from each other. So there's three color classes here. So that's a proper coloring of our hypergraph. And um, the Erdos-Faber-Lovas conjecture 
Um, so before I mention the conjecture, let me uh, introduce what a linear hypergraph is. A linear hypergraph is uh, a hypergraph where any two edges meet in at most one vertex. So we can't have two hyper edges meeting in say at least two vertices. So this is called the bin. In other words, every pair of vertices uh, um, is contained in at most one edge. Okay. So that's a linear hypergraph. And um, Erdős Faber Lua's conjecture, this is posed in 1972. It's quite simple. Now uh, it says that if you take an n-vertex linear hypergraph, then the chromatic index is at most n. So that's all. It says that if you take any n-vertex linear hypergraph, no matter how it looks, you can color it with n colors. And um, so this is, Erdős is uh, one of the three favorite problems mentioned in several papers. And um, he offered initially $50 for the, for the solution of this problem, for a proof or disproof. And he, um, and there's a story that they came up with this conjecture in a party in, um, in 1972. And um, when they came up with it, they, they thought that it would be almost trivial and but it's difficulty realized, they realized the difficulty only slowly. And so um, he raised it to $500. Uh, yeah, so this is a quote from one of his papers, 1991. Okay, so um, there are three, there are many extremal examples, well, three extreme, three extremal examples for this um, graph, but there are actually many, as I will mention. There are some close, um, yeah, I will talk about that soon. So one of them is a projective plane. Uh, so everyone knows what a projective plane is. It's a, so it, you have root n sized edges. So you have edges of size root n, root n sized edges, and there are n of them. And any two edges meet. Any two edges intersect, let us say. So we have n edges and every two edges intersect. So to color a projective plane, then you would need n colors. And it's a linear hypergraph because any two edges meet in exactly one vertex. So, so this is an example where um, the conjecture is sharp. And the other one uh, is a degenerate plane or a near pencil. Uh, and it consists of a huge hyper edge of size n minus one, so there are n minus one vertices in this hyper edge, and there's one vertex outside, and then there are n minus one graph edges like these. So when I say actually for the uh, from now on, when I say a graph edge, I mean an edge of size two, and when I say a hyper edge, I mean an edge of size at least three. It's a convention that I will follow in, um, for this talk. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are there is one hyper edge here of size n minus one, and there are n minus one graph edges as you can see here. And these graph edges, um, because they're all incident to the same vertex, you would need to use different colors to color them, right? So you get one, color one, color two, color three, say color n minus one, and you would use a different color to color the big hyper edge because that hyper edge is incident to all the graph edges. So again, you need n colors to color it, and then it. The third example is a complete graph Kn. When n is odd, it also needs um, n colors to color it. So I know not only Kn, actually some minor modifications of Kn, like say delete an edge from it and it still needs n colors to color it. So as you can see, there are three different examples. And these examples, they're all of different flavors. Um, we have this Kn, which is just a graph. And then we have the projective plane, which is a real hypergraph because the hyper edges are all of size root and they're quite big. And then we have a mixture, this degenerate plane, um, which contains a large hyper edge as well as some graph edges of size two. So we have, perhaps because there are uh, these very different extremal examples uh, is one reason why the problem is difficult. And also, our proof um, splits into cases, depending on whether um, the hypergraph is perhaps close to a projective plane or not. 
and I will talk more about that later. Um, so these are the extreme examples. And there are many, so the, yeah. So the version that we will uh, focus on throughout the talk is the following. I mean, it's the one which I already mentioned that we have, um, they have an n-vertex linear hypergraph and we would like to show that its chromatic index is at most n. So in other words, what we'd like to show is that you can decompose the edges of the hypergraph into n matchings. It's equivalent because each, um, so that we want to color it with n colors and each color class is a, is a matching. And so we would like to decompose our hypergraph into n matchings basically. So here is one matching say, um, and that's another matching. Note that the, because the, you know, the hyper edges can be of any size and the matchings can be of any size, really um, we can have a matching which looks uh, quite mixed. Like we might have um, an edge of size two or you might have an edge of size four. So it can be quite, um, quite mixed. Anyway, so no matter what the, uh, what the hypergraph looks like, our goal is then to uh, decompose the edges of the hypergraph H into these uh, N matchings. So that would be the goal. Uh, the so the graph is not R uniform? It's not R uniform. It can be, it, you can have edges of any size, even singletons or edges of size two, three, even edges of size N, N minus one, anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If there's any questions about the statement, please feel free to ask. Okay, so, um, but there are other, uh, there are dual versions of this problem, um, um, which are, I guess, also very popular. So one such version is the following, which says that if you have um, an N-uniform hypergraph, so I guess this is somewhat similar to Maybe this is the version that some people have seen. Um, here you have edges of size n, n edges of size n. And it's a linear hypergraph. And here the goal is to color the vertices, not the edges, in a way that every edge contains vertices of all colors. So you, you have all, all colors inside here. So kind of like a rainbow. Um, so th this is one version. And, th and this version is the dual version of the, of the version that I just mentioned. One just has to um, look at edges as vertices and vertices as edges. So for example, this edge E would be seen as a vertex and this edge F here would be seen as a vertex. So coloring edges as we wanted previously would now be equivalent to coloring vertices. And um, before we wanted, if you recall, we wanted the edges to be uh, properly colored, namely that all these edges that are incident to this vertex, they should get different um, colors. And now it would be saying that, so this vertex is equivalent to this edge and edges having all, all different, these four edges having different colors is the same as saying these four vertices having different colors. So in other words, now the goal is to somehow uh, color the vertices in a way that um, any two vertices in the same hyper edge, they get different colors. So here you can see this hyper edge, all the vertices have different colors. Yeah, so this is one version, but we won't choose this version. And uh, well, there is another popular version which says that you have N sets, uh, which is actually basically actually completely equivalent to what I just said, that it says that if you have n sets of each of size n, so that any two sets meet in at most one vertex, then you can, you know, color the union of the, the, the of these sets uh, with n colors so that um, all colors appear in each AI. So each AI uh, looks completely rainbow. You get all the colors in each set. And I guess this is, a, this is the version also, this, this version, um, has a nice picture in Wikipedia. So this is the graphic version stated in terms of graphs, which says that um, if you take a graph 
which is the union of n complete graphs, like this, like in this picture, which I took from Wikipedia. Uh, so these four clicks of size four each. Um, so if, if G is the union of n complete graphs, each on at most n vertices, and then uh, such that any two graphs meet at most uh, meet in at most one vertex, then you can um, color the graph in it with at most n colors. So color the vertices of the graph with at most n colors. So in this example, you have uh, four clicks, each of size four, and you can color them with four colors, the vertices properly with n colors, uh, with four colors in this case. Um, yeah, so that's the, yeah, we will also, this is another version of the conjecture, but we won't use it as I mentioned. Um, and it is also worth, before I go on, uh, defining um, the notion of a line graph. So a line graph is simply um, a graph. So line graph of a hypergraph is we look at the edges as vertices. So here, uh, this is a hypergraph here. And we look, we treat the edges of the hypergraph as vertices. And if any two edges meet, then the corresponding um, vertices are adjacent. So for example, um, the edges G and F meet and the vertices G and F the corresponding vertices G and F are adjacent. So we will use this, um, we'll use line graphs in the proof later. So I just uh, introduce them. So um, let me mention some previous results on the conjecture. So there's an easy way to show that the chromatic index is at most two and minus three, which was improved by Chang and lower to three and a half minus two. And um, yeah, and then, um, there are some um, more results um, where the parameters are relaxed. So namely, they don't want to find the, uh, so the goal is to, you know, find other parameters. Like for example, as a result of De Bruyne Erdos, which says that um, if you take, um, if you add, add the additional condition that your hypergraph is intersecting, then the conjecture is true. And Seymour proved that, okay, you can't find n matchings. Uh, you can't decompose, maybe you can't decompose your hypergraph into n matchings, but you can find an average sized matching. Um, so if EFL was true, you can see that there would be a matching of size uh, one over n times the number of edges, right? Because you, 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 you decompose your uh, hypergraph into n matchings. So there will be a matching of average size, which is uh, h over n. So same will prove the, the existence of uh, such a matching, such a large matching. And Khan and Seymour showed the fractional version of the conjecture is true. And, um, and then uh, there are more partial results. Um, Faber and Harris showed that the conjecture is true if um, your edges are, uh, the, if the size of your edges is in this interval, so you have it, if all your edges are of size between three and uh, constant times root 10 um, for some C very small, uh, then they prove that the conjecture is true. And um, Khan, actually, one of the breakthrough results was that he proved that the chromatic, he proved the conjecture asymptotically, namely, uh, and this little of n, little of n here means something, some small epsilon times n. And to prove these results, um, they use, um, um, the nibble approach, it's a probabilistic approach, which I will uh, talk about more, uh, talk more about and describe it with pictures later. And um, both of these results, they use a list coloring version of Pippinger Spencer theorem, which, which is a very nice theorem. It states the following. Um, if, you're hyper, if you take a linear hypergraph with um, bounded edge sizes, so the only condition is that all your edges have to be uh, of size, say, at most 100 or something, some bounded size. And um, maximum degree is at most delta, then the chromatic index of the hypergraph is at most delta plus, it's roughly delta. Um, as you can see, um, so EFL sounds similar, uh, but, they, but we don't have this uh, bounded edge condition. The edges can be of any sizes. And we also don't have any restriction on the max degree. So, so it's quite general, the, uh, the EFL conjecture. Um, and this theorem, um, 
implies that the ESL conjecture is true for hypergraphs, um, as I said, of bounded size. Um, not only bounded size, but if you say they're also of at size at least three, then one can show that uh, it follows quite immediately from Pippinger Spencer theorem that for such hypergraphs, EFL is true. It also follows for hypergraphs of bounded size that the conjecture is asymptotically true, not exactly. Okay, so these are all the previous results so far. If anyone has any questions on this, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, um, so what we prove is that the erdos faber lewas conjecture, the EFL conjecture is true um, when n is sufficiently large. Um, so in other words, we show that the conjecture is true for all but finitely many hypergraphs. Um, and along the way, we also prove a stability result, which says that if, um, if you don't have a vertex of large degree, so if your max degree is somehow small, so which is a natural condition, right? So if you, if you have a very high degree vertex, then you would need to use different colors for all these edges. So if, say for example, you have a vertex of degree close to n, then you would need to use n colors. So if you want a stability result where you would not want to show that the chromatic index is bounded away from n, then um, this condition is necessary. So you would need to say that there's, a, there's no vertex of really large degree. And the second condition is that you are somehow far from a projective plane. So you don't have, uh, so the, the edges of size close to root n, one plus minus delta root n are, are bounded away from n. So recall that in a projective plane, we have n edges of size root n. And this second condition says that you have few edges of size close to root n. So well, this condition says that you are far from a projective plane. And this condition says that in some sense, you are far from a kn and the other degenerate plane example. So given these two conditions, uh, what we show is that the chromatic index can be shown to be bounded away from n. So uh, the EFL says the chromatic index is at most n, and we show that um, it's bounded away from n if you impose these, uh, these additional conditions. And this confirms a prediction of Kahn uh, from one of his papers. So these are the results. And um, yeah, now I will um, sketch the proof of the theorem. Um, and the proof, so this is the big picture of the proof and um, it's very approximate, um, but and I wanted to just convey the main ideas. So, um, yeah, so, okay. So before I start the sketch of the proof, if you have any questions so far, feel free to ask. Okay, then I will proceed. Um, so let's say uh, our hypergraph is H. It's an n-vertex linear hypergraph. And uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'll denote it by H. And we will classify the edges of the hypergraph into two types. So edges of size at most R, these are called small edges. And edges of size at least R are more than R, these are large edges. So we have two types of edges, small edges and large edges. And the first step of the proof is to color uh, large edges. In a way, check, is, R, is R a constant or is it related to N? It's a constant, yeah. It's a fixed constant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, so the first step is to show, is to color the large edges. So in a way that we have some control on the size of the color classes. And this is important. So what I mean is that we want to color all the large edges, so edges of size more than R, in a way that each color class occupies few vertices. Uh, maybe I'll explain it with a picture here. So, so these are meant to be the color classes of large edges. So they are large because I drew them, the edges are quite big. So, so these are the large edges. And the first step is to color the large edges in a way that each color class so each um, M, M1 hat, M, M1 tilde, M2 tilde. M, so these are the largest color classes. I want these color classes to be small. I want them to occupy as you know, few vertices, only little of n vertices. 
And as you immediately see, this is not always possible. For example, this exam, um, you know, this um, example which I mentioned, the degenerate plane, where um, you know you have this vertex outside and you have a huge edge of size n minus one. Of course, we can't make sure that the color classes are small in this case. So there are some exceptions, but um, but those can be handled separately. For the vast majority of the color classes, this will be true. Okay, anyway, so the first step is to color your large edges in a way that the color classes are small. And let us say uh, that the color classes are M1 hat, M2 hat, um, and M1 minus rho and hat. So, um, oh, I before I go on, so I need to say that when we color the large edges, um, the proof roughly split, uh, splits into two cases. As I mentioned before, the proof um, differentiates uh, between whether you are close to a projective plane or not. So the way it differentiates is it first tries to color the large edges, and you see whether, how many colors you need to color your large edges. If you need, um, if you can color your large edges with uh, with few less than n colors, so color some um, one minus row n colors bounded away from n, then that's say let's say that's case A. But if you need to color them with close to, um, if you need to use almost all your colors to color your large edges, then let's say that's case B. Um, so let me first talk about case A. Uh, so the case when you can color all your uh, large edges with only one minus row n colors. And for convenience, I will uh, denote one minus row n by K for the rest of this talk. Okay, so these are the color large edge color classes. One, um, M1 tilde to M1 minus row tilde. And um, so the second step, is so, so the first step, I, need, I should mention the first step is not trivial and I will come back to it later. But having done the first steps, having colored the large edges in a way that the color classes are small, um, the second step is to extend these color classes um, like this in, some, in, a, in somehow a very careful way. And the goal, um, is that when we uh, what we want to do is we want to extend these color classes somehow in a way that the leftover graph, so the edges which don't appear in these matchings, uh, they are somehow the leftover graph is somehow nice. So in the sense that the leftover graph has small maximum degree. So why do we want the leftover graph to have small maximum degree? Uh, let's say it has only maximum degree rho n or something, then we can use, for example, Wiesling's theorem to, sh to color the leftover graph with rho n colors. And um, these rho n colors together with the one minus rho n colors that uh, correspond to these one minus rho n matching, so each matching corresponds to a color, that give you, they give you n colors. That's, that's proving the conjecture in this case. Um, so the challenge is to somehow find these matchings, M1, M2, M1 minus rho n, or construct these matchings in a way that the leftover graph is nice. The max degree of the leftover graph is, um, is small, only rho n. And that's one thing. Another thing we want is that the leftover graph is really a graph. We don't want any hyper edges left over. So in step two, when we extend these matchings, we want also to cover all edges of size at least three. So in some sense, step two is the, is, the, is the most important step of the proof because here we construct majority of the matchings um, by extending this large edge color classes. Um, and as I will mention, we will use uh, rudel label to extend them, uh, to find them in a way that they are compatible with the large edge color classes. And then we will have to manually extend these matchings further um, to be able to have this control, which I mentioned that the leftover graph has small maximum degree rho n. So that's the plan. Uh, yeah? Can you explain this a bit more in detail or are you planning to, like, uh, how you plan to explain the steps yeah. more in detail? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will explain, I'm going to step two uh, much more in detail, but first I just give the big picture. I was just wondering how do you get the first approximate things in your life, and then you apply needle, like in which, how do you apply needle? After the new eyes, I think. So, so you mean, uh, can you say that again, Liana? 
couldn't hear. I just mean that it seems like you is the nibble the, really the first step? Is, is it with the nibble that you get the... No, the, the first step is to get these large edge colored glasses uh, to be very small. And Some how do you do that? Yeah, that's also a non-trivial thing. We use, uh, I will come back to that later, but what we, we, okay, okay. we, work, we work with line graphs of the hypergraph. So we reduce the problem to a vertex coloring problem. We treat the hyper edges as vertices and coloring the hyper edges would be the same as coloring vertices. And we use some results on locally, coloring locally sparse graphs and so on. So that's a, I will talk about it at the very end if I have time. Um, yeah. and. I will also talk about step two more in detail. Um, but the big picture is, is, the, is what I said for case A. Um, but case B, uh, as you already probably guessed, uh, because we need to use N colors for the large edges, um, you know, when we get our leftover graph, uh, we will still need to color the leftover graph in a way that it is compatible with. But well, here, in case A, what, what happened was um, the, the color classes of the large edges only used one minus row n colors. So the leftover graph didn't, was, we could use a fresh set of colors to color our leftover graph, and there was no problem, um, no conflict or anything. But in case B, if you really need to use n colors for your large edges, then uh, after having constructed this one minus row and mappings and getting this leftover graph um, of size two edges, you still need to color this leftover graph in a way that it's compatible with these uh, large edge color classes. But that can be done um, by using some information about, um, you know, uh, some information about these large edge color classes, by the, using the fact that these large edge color classes actually need end color. So you can say that then, the la um, then this hypergraph is somehow close to a projective plane. So we have some nice properties. So that's the big picture. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, so this is not, a, not the difficult part. The difficult part is indeed uh, step two to, uh, and actually also step one, but step, mainly step two, to be able to construct these matchings, these one minus row and matchings, uh, so that the leftover graph has um, small maximum degree. Okay. So now I will, uh, I will, I will try to uh, explain step two from now on. For the most of the talk, it will be about step two. So uh, where the goal, and also I will assume there are no large, large edge color classes. Uh, and you can kind of believe me that it's not a big deal to assume the large edge color classes are not there if you assume step one is true, because these large edge color classes they occupy. Uh, only little of n vertices each. So each color class occupies only a little of n vertices. So they don't cause too much uh, disruption to your nibble. So when you find these matchings with nibble, um, you just have to you know, deal with this little of n. You just have to make sure that this nibble matching is compatible with your little of n vertices that occupy, that this color class occupies. So, to illustrate the proof, I will assume that we only have small edges, so we don't have large edges. So we don't have step one for now. So let's say we only we only have small edges. So edges um, when by that I mean edges of size at most r or something. And um, I'll try to illustrate how we color the small edges. So in other words, how we do this little part here, um, so that the leftover graph uh, has small maximum degree. So that would be the goal now. So just to repeat, uh, we want to construct these K matchings, M1 to MK, so that um, the leftover graph is, a, leftover is actually a graph, there are no hyper edges, and the maximum degree of the leftover graph is what you want it to be, uh, N minus K. And N minus K is, a, is the right number, which is row in, uh, in, the, in my picture before. Uh, it's the right number because this N minus K, uh, if you show that the leftover graph can, uh, has maximum degree N minus K, then uh, using Wizzing, for example, you can color it with n minus k plus one colors. And these n minus k plus one colors together with the k colors of the k matchings that give you n plus one, not n as we wanted. So it's a bit weaker. Um, and to save this plus one, we need additional ideas. But um, yeah, so the goal is the following, yeah, to find these k matchings so that the max degree 
is at most n minus k for the leftover graph when you remove these matchings from h. Okay, um, so how do we get this control? Um, how do we show that the leftover graph has max degree at most n minus k? Um, before uh, showing those ideas, let me just define um, the notion of a high degree vertex and a low degree vertex. So I, I just need to distinguish between these two vertices. So a vertex is high degree if it has degree at least one minus epsilon times n, epsilon is some small parameter, small uh, parameter. And low degree if it has degree less than one minus rho n. And um, first I want to convince you that low degree vertices are nice in the sense that they easily satisfy this condition that um, that when you that you can find these matchings m1 through mk so that the max so that when you remove these matchings the degree of that low degree vertex is n minus k so let me uh, convince you of that easily so um, to show that um, as i said these matchings m1 through mk they are found uh, using rudel and Bohr, so they have some pseudo random properties um, so because they have the pseudo random properties, if you take any vertex, um, it already ends up in most of the matchings because, well, these matchings are pseudo random. So it would be unlikely that a vertex is left out by most of the matchings, for example. So if your vertex was a low degree vertex, so if it has degree at most one minus epsilon n, and if you believe these matchings m1 through mk are somehow pseudo random, so removing these matchings then drops your degree by something like k minus gamma n. It's not k, maybe, but that vertex appears in almost all of the matchings, like k minus gamma n. So one minus epsilon minus k minus gamma n, it would be less than n minus k if you choose your parameters carefully. And then you're happy. So you're already happy with your low degree vertices because they end up in most of the matchings, m1 through mk. So when you remove them, um, the degree is as desired. So let me just um, illustrate this with a picture here. So, so these matchings, M1, M2, Mk here, which I drew here. So as I said, these matchings are found using uh, Rudel label. So, and I will explain, I guess, I will explain more. So for now, uh, it suffices to know that there is some randomness involved when finding these matchings M1 through Mk. Because of that, if you take a, so here is your hypergraph H, Let's say these are your uh, high degree vertices, which these yellow vertices, and these are your low degree vertices. Let, let me denote high degree vertices by u and the low degree vertices by v minus u, so the complement of u. And as I mentioned, just to recap, high degree vertices are vertices of degree at least one minus epsilon n, and low degree are vertices of degree less than one minus epsilon n. Now, if you take any uh, low degree vertex, and because this matching M1 through Mk are constructed via, the, via this pseudo random uh, approach because they have, a, they have this pseudo random properties. You would expect this W, which I just erased, um, this W to end up in almost all of the matchings. Um, and so when you remove your matchings, then the degree drops, the degree of, what, uh, of the vertex W drops by what you want and the degree of this vertex in the leftover graph is at most n minus k as desired. That's what you wanted. And this, so this is automatic from uh, the pseudo randomness of this matching, m1 through mk. So the difficulty then is to show that is to deal with the high degree vertices. So this vertex x uh, is very demanding because you want to show that when you remove these matchings, uh, the degree of this vertex drops to n minus k. And to be able to do that, for example, if this vertex x has degrees, has degree n minus one say, then you would actually need to show that this vertex appears in all of the matchings. So you can't actually, it's not enough that this vertex x um, appears in almost all of the matchings. You may actually need to show that this vertex appears in all of the matchings. And the reason is, um, let me just show you. So if your vertex x has degree n minus one, then say that the vertex of degree is n minus one uh, in your hypergraph, then if you show that this vertex appears in almost in all of your matchings mi, then when you remove these matchings, then it drops to n minus one minus k, 
and then you can apply this ink and then you are happy because well um yeah this is even better than what we want but one minus one is not important um so the conclusion is that if you have a high degree vertex uh then you want it to end up in all of the notchings so that's why we need um we need to be careful about the high degree vertices. So these matchings, M1 through Mk, the pseudo randomness of these matchings is not enough to deal with the high degree matchings. So what we need to do is to extend these matchings M1 through Mk that we got y and above in a way that each matching covers all the vertices of U, all the high degree vertices. So, so in particular, this vertex X, which I was talking about has to appear, would be in U and it would be it would appear in all of the matchings. So that's the goal. So if you have any questions so far, um, please ask. So, so as I said, um, we want to, just to iterate the goal, um, we want the high degree vertices uh, to be, we may want to ensure that the high degree vertices are in all of the matchings. And these matchings, M1 through Mk, they don't ensure that. They only ensure that a vertex appears in almost all of the matchings. So we need to somehow manually place this mat this uh, vertex X in all of the matchings. Um, so that would be the goal to somehow extend these matchings M1 through MK so that each of these matchings, MI, they cover all vertices of U, all the high degree vertices. And I hope you're convinced that if we if we are able to do this, if we can extend these matchings to cover all the high degree vertices, then we are good because removing these matchings then drops the degree of each vertex to n minus k. That's our goal, which would be, uh, and we would be happy. So okay, so so now um, I will explain how we will do this, how we will extend these matchings so that uh, you know we can cover all the vertices of U. But before that, I, I kept saying um, that we construct these matchings MI using Rudel label. So let me quickly explain what that means. Um, so these matchings M1, M2, Mk, each of these matchings, let's say this is a matching um, MI, each of these uh, color classes is um, constructed um, as follows. In each step, we choose a random set of uh, a random set of edges with very small probability, uh, like this. And because you choose them with very small probability, you will find them. You will find many pairwise disjoint edges like this. And some of them might overlap, but you just um, ignore those. And then you repeat. So, and then you delete these vertices. And in the rest of the hypergraph, so this one, you you repeat again. So you again find, you again, um, so maybe I use green so, because we're finding a green matching. So you delete this and now you repeat again. So you again choose your uh, hyper edges with very low probability, then you will find some, um, some edges which are all pairwise disjoint from each other. Some of them might overlap like this. And then again, you, you delete this and then you extend again, and then you iterate again, and you find your next set of, then you again set, uh, select your hyper just randomly and so on. So in each step, you extend your matching somehow, um, byte by byte, so uh, slowly. And that's how you construct each of your, um, each of your uh, matching same I. Um, and as you can see, there is a this this is the this is what they call the semi-random method. So because it's not completely random, there are several steps. So it's a semi-random method. And as you can see, this is what I meant by this is what I meant by these matchings being pseudo-random. So this property of these matchings, uh, so so each matching is somehow constructed this way. So in each step, we um, extend it slowly. So and then we build a very large matching at the end. So there is one nice property that we get when we do this. And this is what I will describe here. 
Um, so when we build our match in this way, so uh, step by step, um, then we will have this nice property. The property that we will have is um, given any family of sets, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, um, we can make sure that the matching that we produced covers almost all the vertices of each of the sets. Not only that, so the, the nibble approach which I described gives you a large matching that covers almost all of the vertices. But not only that, it also um, covers almost all the vertices of each of the each of a prescribed given sets. Like so, you are given a um, bunch of sets S1, S2, S5 in advance, and then um, the and then you apply the nibble, um, and the matching that you get not only covers almost all the vertices of your um, of your ground set but it also covers almost all the vertices of this S size in a nice way. So the right proportion of each of these uh, pre-given sets. And this is important for us, um, as I will explain. Um, okay, so just to recap, I just, uh, this is what I meant by the pseudo-randomness properties of these matchings, M1 through MK, so they are obtained by a nibble. And uh, as our goal was to extend these matchings to cover all the U vertices. So le let me explain how we do that. Um, so at the beginning of the proof, at the very beginning of the proof, we set aside a set of um, reservoir edges. Um, we choose a set of edges uh, randomly. So from the edges of, only from the edges of size two, so from the graph edges. Uh, so we choose row proportion of the graph edges randomly. So for each vertex then uh, here, these are the edges selected, which I colored with red. So these are the reserved edges. And then you take out these reserved edges. Um, and then what's left over, the max degree of the leftover graph is something like one minus rho n, because you reserved rho proportion of all the graph edges. So it would be something like this. And these non-reserved edges are is what we use nibble on. To, so we run this rudal nibble algorithm, which I just explained, to find these matchings m1, m2, mk, um, k being one minus rho n roughly, because we have one minus rho because the max degree of this non-reserved edges is like one minus rho n. You can find one minus rho n matchings, and then um, we want to extend these matchings using the reservoir edges which we reserved, uh, so that we cover u. So just to recap, so these that matchings M1 through MK, these are the matchings that we get by enable. And then these uh, reserved edges that we uh, selected randomly at the beginning is what we use to extend these matchings M1 through MK to cover the side degree vertices U. So let me just quickly explain that with a picture. Um, so yeah, as I said, these are the matchings M1 through MK that we get by enable. And these are the U vertices here and we want to extend these matchings using the reservoir edges, using the R edges, using the reserved edges, um, so that we cover all the U vertices. Uh, and how do we do that? Um, and it's, this is a, this is actually quite nice. So here is your U vertices, so your high degree vertices, which may be under shade. And our goal is to cover all these uh, U vertices. And here is our matching MI. Um, say do I use green so yeah it actually drew it here already so this green bit is is our matching mi and before we find this matching what we actually do is for each vertex of u we prescribe the sets um, we look at the r neighborhoods of them in u and also in the complement of u and these sets are what we give in advance and then we ask the matching, uh, the pseudo random matching to cover the right proportion of the, of the neighbor, neighborhoods of X. So it covers the right proportion of this part and the right proportion of this part. So there are actually two things that we are using. Because this vertex X is a high degree vertex, it somehow sees almost all the vertices. And then because the reservoir is chosen randomly, so the R edges are somehow nicely distributed. And because this matching MI uh, is pseudo-random, it behaves very nicely with the neighborhoods, with the U neighborhood of X here and also the non-U neighborhood of X here. So in conclusion, 
these uh, these edges, these uncovered edges here, um, they are very nicely distributed. They're well distributed. And that is what we use to uh, cover the vertices of U. So if U is small, so there are two cases. These high degree vertices can be very small. Like for example, in a projective plane, they are very small. Or in a KN, you have very many high degree vertices, like almost all the vertices are high degree. Depending on what case you are in, so if you have very few uh, high degree vertices, then you use Hall's theorem to cover your U vertices like this. So this way, uh, or if U is uh, quite large, then you would need to uh, cover your U like this. So this is the case when you're say close to a KN or something. And in this case, there is an additional problem. Namely, there, there is a parity issue. So you might not be able to cover all your U vertices. There might be a vertex of U, there might be a vertex of U which you couldn't cover because, just because the number of vertices here is odd. So there, that's where the, the plus one comes in. So because, so to save the plus one, what we need to show. So this, what I just mentioned here, shows you shows how you can cover the U vertices. Up to, a, up to a vertex. So you can make sure that each of these matching MI can be extended so that you cover all the vertices of you, but maybe one vertex is left out. And um, this gives you a result of n plus one at the end instead of n. Um, so if you show that the chromatic index is at most n plus one. But if you actually want to show that the chromatic index is at most n, then um, you would actually need to show that your leftover graph has some additional properties. So. To show this, what we needed to show is that the leftover graph of, has only one property, namely that the max decree is at most um, n minus k. But, uh, and then we used Vzinc. But in this case, we can't use Vzinc, because if we just used Vzinc here, um, then we would still get this plus one. So we would want to use, uh, we want to show that the leftover graph has some uh, some nice lower regularity property, namely that if you take any big enough, any two big enough sets, you have the right density between them and so on. So we need some extra work to go from, to, to save this plus one. But uh, yeah, so this is the rough idea uh, for step two. I hope it is clear. So let me go back to the big picture. So what I just explained now is that these matchings M1 through MK, uh, Majority of these matchings are found via Nibble using this, uh, these pseudo random matchings. And then uh, using these R edges, these reservoir edges here, we extended them to cover these high degree vertices. So these little sets here, these are high degree vertices. Um, so, so that then we have uh, that the leftover graph has small max degree. So that is what I explained. Uh, I don't think I have time to explain uh, how we color the large edges. Uh, but let me just mention some very vague uh, tools that we use. Uh, the tools we use is we look at the large edges. Um, we look at the line graph of the hypergraph formed by large edges, and we will somehow show that this line graph has some properties. So in one case, it splits into two cases. In one case, we show that the that the line graph is locally sparse. So if you look at the neighborhood of a vertex then the, there are few edges in the neighborhood of that vertex. I mean, uh, not few meaning bounded away from, if you, if you have a vertex of degree D, then you have bounded away from D choose two edges. So it turns out that the line graph has this nice property. So you can color the vertices of the line graph uh, using few colors and um, that corresponds to coloring edges with few colors and so on. So we use those kind of tools to color the large edges, uh, but I won't be able to explain that now. But let me finish by mentioning um, a conjecture, which would be a common generalization of uh, Wiesing theorem and EFL, which says that if you take any linear hypergraph, then the chromatic index is at most, um, well, it's, if you take any vertex, we look at the edges containing that vertex, um, and then the number of vertices occupied by these edges. So for example, if you take a graph, then this would be delta plus one. So yeah, this is uh, open and our tools don't work here because 
as I said, we use this. Um, we really use the that there are vertices with uh, very large degree, and then because they have very large degree, and when you um, sample your reservoir, the reservoir edges are nicely distributed, and they behave nicely with your pseudo random matching MI and all that. So those don't fail. So those those don't work. So we, we can't show the conjecture, but it's a, quite an interesting one. And there is another one uh, called list EFL conjecture. Um, here, the goal is um, you want to, you know, list color your hypergraph with n colors at most. And this would imply EFL, of course, because if you choose your list to be um, one to n, one through n, then it would be the same as EFL. And that's also open. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for listening and yeah, feel free to ask any question. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Abhishek, for a real interesting talk. And maybe before we go to the question section, to the part of the, for the questions, let's, whoever wishes to unmute themselves, please unmute yourself and uh, give Abhishek a round of applause. Okay, so questions to Abhishek? So I'm curious, is there a, a notion of something like a quadratic hypergraph where you know, in a linear hypergraph, there is no pair. So now there would be no triple. And could you make a conjecture there? Mm. There is a there is a result of Allen and Kim, which talk, uh, where they try to color hypergraphs where any two edges meet in at most t vertices or something. Yeah. So there is some, there is some conjecture uh, there. It's a paper of Allen and Kim. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the result uh, okay. right now, but there is some study like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, will your methods apply to this list coloring conjecture? Uh, not directly. There are some difficulties. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some fundamental difficulties. I would say. Can you say more? Or uh, well, it's hard to say. I mean. The difficulties, they, we use a lot of this, the way we choose our reservoir and the way we uh, extend these matchings, MI, they're all very, you know, structured. So for list coloring, maybe there is a way to do it um, using, in, inspired by these ideas, but not directly. Yeah, I guess uh, related to Liana's question. So, it, what's the best for the list at dash Faber Lovas? Is it the Kahn's? I mean, there is the there is the the asymptotic solution of Kahn, which I guess has a polynomial error term, right? Polynomial in n. Yeah, epsilon n. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this would give you yeah. Um, so there is a way to use Kahn's ideas to show n plus litter of n for the list TFL. But um, yeah. But that's about, I mean, it's basically a basically can't screw, but with some small modifications. So, no n plus log n, no, or something no. like that, not even n, n plus n to the epsilon. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Bishop, what do you mean? I mean, Kant's result already gives you n to the one minus epsilon, no? So, are you saying you can improve that? So Kant's result is n plus epsilon n, uh, right? For some small epsilon. But I thought those epsilon was like something like n to the minus alpha. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I haven't looked into it carefully. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, but that's different from n plus n to the epsilon. Yeah, I know. It's just because he said that uh, he could improve Kant's result to n to the n one minus epsilon. No, no, we can't improve Kant's result. We just, whatever Kant's result, um, so Kant didn't say, uh, praise his result uh, for in the list EFL way. So his result is about bounded edges. So um, 
in his paper, he has, what he proved is that if you take a hypergraph where all the edges have bounded size, then there is a list, there is this, okay. So he proved that if you take a hypergraph with max degree delta and all the edges are of size at most K, then the chromatic index, the least chromatic index is something close to delta, right? So this is what he showed. Mm -hmm. So this is not, this does not directly imply list EFL because of course there are two problems with it. First, uh, I mean, the main problem is that he assumed they just are bounded size. But uh, his proof ideas can be easily modified to, you know, to give this for even when they just are not a bounded size and to get, get n plus little of n from there. But this mm -hmm. little of n it could be like what you said, it could be something like into the one minus half, I'm not sure. But yeah, so basically Kant's paper, even though he doesn't state list EFL, um, implies it, implies this asymptote equation. Okay, thank you.